Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Tor Talk Weekly Parsha with Rabbi Rafi Mullet. This week is Parsha Bamikbar. And so this week, uh, he has a, had to pre record this week because he is, uh, his. Um, daughter graduate eighth grade uh, graduation he had intended to so he's with us right now virtually i've got his recording ready to play no one's heard it you guys are the first ones to lay ears on it so it's exciting and new and we are this whole thing is being played live so you'll be able to uh to chat in the youtube chat box as well put in your questions i'm not sure if he'll be in or not he may be um he's a teacher so school transition between school and home is uh might be a little sensitive there so uh who knows he might show up in the chat so um Without further ado, we will go ahead and move on and get this show started. So, uh, welcoming again Rabbi Rafi Mullet with Parshat Bamidbar. Thank you for having me back on Torah Talk Weekly Parsha on Tanakh Talk. I'm so glad to be here. Unfortunately, today I had a scheduling conflict. My daughter Baruch Hashem is graduating the eighth grade, and I will be at her graduation rather than live to give this class, so I'm recording it earlier, and I hope you enjoy it. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Bamidbar, a very exciting Parsha. One of the things that's so exciting about it is that it shares its name with the title of the book Bamidbar. We are entering the fourth of the five books of Moses, so how exciting is it to start a whole new book of Torah, the book of Bamidbar. Now Bamidbar, literally means in the desert and it takes its name from the opening words of the Parsha that tells us that this occurred Bimidbar Sinai in the Sinai desert. So from the word Bimidbar we, in the desert of Sinai we get the word Bamidbar which just means in the desert and that is sort of the colloquial title of this book. However, the technical title is something called Chumash Pekudim, Chumash Pekudim. Now a Chumash, in Hebrew, you hear the word Chumash, means from the Hebrew word Chamesh, which means five. Since there are five books of Moses, each one is called a Chumash, which means like basically one-fifth of the Torah. And the fourth Chumash, the fourth-fifth, the fourth book is known as the Chumash of Pekudim. Pekudim is translated in English as numbers. That's why in English it's the book of numbers. And it's characterized by many, many countings. So it makes sense why it's called the Book of Numbers. There are many, many countings that go on in the Book of Numbers. Specifically in this first parsha, which is called the Parsha's Bamidbar, we have a number of countings just to begin with. We have a count of the entire Jewish people, tribe by tribe. So we get the individual numbers of each tribe, plus we get the total number of the Jewish people. We have a counting by name, as it were, of the princes who are appointed one over each tribe in this chapter. And then we have a counting of the camps. The, the camp of Israel, the larger camp of Israel, is divided into four camps. And each camp was comprised of three tribes. And each one of those camps encamped on one of four sides of the tabernacle, so you had three on each side, and so we get the numbers of the overall size of the camps, and the tribe of Levi is counted separately from the tribe of Israel, so we have a counting of the tribe of Levi, then the tribe of Levi is divided into three families, Gershon, Kehos, and Mirari, each one of those families are counting, and we have a counting of those families, then we have an appointing of princes over each of those families, uh, and so on and so forth. We have many countings. Later on in the book of Numbers, we'll have another counting of the Jewish people. And in that way, the book of Numbers is filled with numbers. It's filled with countings of the Jewish people. But as we'll see, not just countings of numbers, but also countings of names. Now, as we begin a new book of the Torah, we have to understand the theme that underlies all the books of the Torah and specifically come to the fore in the beginning of each of the books. And that is as follows. We find that Rashi, in his comments to the beginnings of each of the five books of the Torah, 
he will count, excuse me, he will comment in particular about one aspect of reality. And that aspect of reality that's always pointed out in Rashi's commentary in the beginning of each one of the books of the Torah is the relationship between God and the Jewish people and how that relationship is pivotal to the creation of the world. Let's see in particular each one. When we go to the book of Genesis, the first Chumash in the Torah, the book of Genesis, Bereshis, we find that it begins like this. Bereshis bara Elohim es hashamayim ve'es ha'aretz, which is usually translated as, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. However, Rashi, the classic commentator, when I mention Rashi, I'm talking about the most classic commentator on the Torah. Rashi tells us that this is not a correct rendering of the words, and he's correct. As a matter of fact, the word bereshis does not mean in the beginning. The, the beginning, beginning would be rishona. Rishona would be the beginning. Barishona would mean would mean in the beginning. But reshis, which is a similar word, a related word from the word rosh, rosh being the head, the head or the beginning. So we have rosh. Rishon is first or beginning, Rishona and Reshis, all from the same root. But Reshis has another quality to it, and that is that it is that the word Reshis actually means the beginning of, the beginning of. And it relies on the word that follows to tell you what it is the beginning of. However, in the first verse of Genesis, that is totally absent. We have a very enigmatic verse that says, Bereshis, in the beginning of, Bara Elohim es hashamayim ve'es ha'aretz. In the beginning of, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning of what? In the beginning of what? So Rashi offers as a sort of plain meaning translation that maybe what it means is, in the beginning of, God's creating the heaven and the earth, comma, in other words, in the beginning of the creation, verse 2, the earth was void and empty and etc. Meaning it's, it's sort of not a complete sentence. The second verse is a continuation of, of, the, of the phrase. In the beginning of God's creating the heaven and earth. Mm -mm. But that in itself also is somewhat lacking because it doesn't say in the beginning of creating it says in the beginning of created, past tense verb, God created. So even that is, remains enigmatic. So Rashi offers another explanation as follows. He says, perhaps it doesn't mean in the beginning of. Perhaps it means with something called racious, God created the heavens and earth. Because the prefix before the word racious, which means beginning of, that be. Beratious, that be prefix means could mean in, could also mean with. So perhaps rather than in the beginning of, it means with something that is called racious, God created the heaven and the earth. And so what is that thing called racious that God is using to create the heaven and the earth? So Rashi identifies two candidates that we find in the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, we have a verse that says, Hashem kanani reishis darki. Hashem created me or acquired me as the beginning of His way. And in context, the speaker there is the Torah itself. The Torah is saying that God created me first. Hashem kanani reishis darko. Hashem created me as the beginning of His way. The beginning of God's process was to begin with the Torah. And that's something that we've spoken about in the past. Maybe in my other classes, I don't know if in this series, but I've spoken about many times, and it's the Jewish literature is filled with it, that in fact, God is the ultimate architect, like any good architect, creates a plan, creates a blueprint before creating the artifice, before creating the edifice, the, the structure itself. So, in other words, what that means is God had a goal in mind. God had something in mind. He didn't just create the world willy-nilly. He had a goal in mind, and with the goal in mind, He created the world. This is a famous Jewish phrase that goes like this. 
Sof ma'aseh b'machashava techila. The end of action is the beginning of thought. Before we set out on an action, we first have to think about what is the purpose of our action. We know what we want to achieve. Once we have a desire, we have a will, we have a ratzon, a will, a desire to achieve something, then we figure out what's the appropriate action to achieve it and we carry out the action. So even prior to the action, there's thought. What was the thought that preceded the action of the creation of the world? It was the thought of the Torah. It was the plan of the Torah. God wanted this Torah to come into being and be fulfilled and therefore created a means for that to happen, which is the world. And the world is a construction essentially based on the blueprint of what is needed to fulfill this Torah. So the whole world is created through the prism of the Torah. The Torah is called Rashis. Rashis Darko, the beginning of God's way. That's a verse in, in Proverbs. So that verse in Proverbs becomes a retroactive uh, decoder to tell us that the with Rashis that Hashem created the world with in the beginning, in the first verse of Genesis, is with the Torah in mind. And Rashi goes further to say that another Rashis that we find in Scripture is the nation of Israel. That Israel is called by Jeremiah, and I believe it's chapter 2, verse 3. He says, God calls the nation of Israel, Rashis Tivuaso, the first, the beginning of God's produce. The very beginning of God's produce, Tivua, like produce that grows in a field. The beginning of God's produce is Israel. Now, how could that be? Israel wasn't the first thing created, there were many generations before there was an individual Israel or a nation of Israel. So what does the prophet mean when he calls Israel Rashis Tivuas, the beginning of God's produce? And it means exactly this, that God's first thought, the plan with which God said, now I need a world, was God planned for there to be an Israel. God wanted to have a partner. God wanted to have a people upon whom to bestow His loving kindness and His infinite goodness. So it was with the people of Israel that would fulfill the Torah. It was the Torah and its fulfillment with the people of the Torah. Israel and the Torah together, these two things, this was God's goal. I want there to be a people that fulfills the Torah. The people who fulfill the Torah is my goal. And therefore, with that goal, I can now proceed to create the world. So be racious, with racious, with these two items called racious, the Torah and Israel, in combination, God set out to create the heavens and the earth. So what emerges from that is that the entire purpose of creation was for God to have a relationship with the nation of Israel. Now, if you're watching this and you're not Jewish and you're wondering what place does that leave for me, we know that God commanded, commands also to the righteous among the earth who are meant to attach themselves to the nation of Israel through the Torah through the Torah. And therefore, even though you're going to say, yeah, but the laws of Noah preceded the Torah, it's true. However, <coughs> Maimonides writes in his code of law that the, non, the righteous non-Jews who fulfill the laws of Noah must do so with the intent that it was commanded in the Torah through Moses. That even though there was, so to speak, a Noahic covenant before the Torah, was given at Sinai. Once the Torah was given at Sinai, which includes a revelation of these laws, the covenant now shifts into a covenant that is wrapped up with the covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai through the Torah. The, the Torah now reveals the laws of Noah and therefore when a righteous Noahide will keep the laws that apply to him, with this intent in mind that the Rambam tells us that it was revealed in the Torah through Moses, they then attach themselves to the Torah of Moses, to the people of Israel and its fulfillment, and share in this ultimate relationship, which is why our sages tell us that such a person does earn a share in the world to come, like the people of Israel. So, this does apply to you. Now, what was the point I was making is to show that the Torah begins with a statement of God's relationship with Israel in the beginning of each book. Now I just said, did Genesis, now let's look at Exodus. So Exodus begins with, in, in Hebrew, this is called the book of Shemos, the book of names, because it begins with a reference to these are the names of the people of Israel who came to Egypt. And it lists 
the, the people of Israel, Jacob and his family that came down to Israel. So Rashi makes the comment over there in the beginning of that book. He says, well, at the end of Genesis, you also counted Yaakov, Jacob, and his family, Israel, who went down to Egypt by name. Why repeat it again over here? So Rashi says the reason that it's repeated is to reveal to us, the reader, God's love for Israel. That He loves us so much that He's not satisfied to count us only once or to name us only once, but He wants to count us and name us again. Now here the, the, um, the analogy isn't given, but there is an analogy found in the work of the sages that it's like a person who loves his treasure so he enjoys going into his treasure house and counting his money, even though he knows how much he has, but he gets such a pleasure from counting it again, you know, $1, $2, $3, $100, $200, $1,000, $1,000, $3,000. dollars It gives him immense joy because he has so much pleasure from, from this acquisition. So Israel is God's acquisition. He says, it's not enough for me to count you one time. I get pleasure from looking at you again and paying attention to you again and giving individual notice to you again. This one and this one and this one and this one. Let me go again. Oh, I have Yanka Lynch, Merrill and Beryl and, and so on and so forth. The counting reveals God's love and affection for the Jewish people. I picture in my head, you know, Scrooge McDuck going for a swim through his... Uh, through his vault of gold, you know, it's just, it's so much pleasure for him to dance in his money because that's what is valued to him. So God, he, he dances through his beloved nation by counting them and recounting them, naming them and renaming them. So again, the beginning of the book of Exodus reveals this loving relationship between God and the, the Jewish people. When we get to the book of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus is called in Hebrew, Sefer Vayikra, the book of Vayikra, which means and he called because God calls to Moshe in the beginning. But the interesting about the thing about the verse in Leviticus, it says that God called to Moshe and spoke to him these words to speak to Israel, etc. What's with all the speaking? He called to him, he spoke to them to tell to Israel, right? So Rashi says that the calling, why doesn't just say God spoke to Moshe and told him to tell Israel or whatever it is? Why he called to Moshe and he spoke to him? Well, obviously. I mean, what does it mean? He called him and spoke to him. Just tell me he spoke to him, obviously. No. It says Rashi that the, the, the affection, the affection between God and Moshe was such that he called to him first. He didn't just suddenly appear to him like, blah, 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 start speaking like casually or, or coldly or robotically, but rather to acknowledge the relationship God first called to Moshe. Moshe. Moshe, it's me, God, calling you. I want to speak to you. He referred to Moshe by name. The, the intimacy that's implied by a, a, so to say, when we say that we're on a first name basis with someone. Me and so and so on a first name basis. It indi indicates a level of closeness and a level of friendship. And Rashi points this out, that God's closeness with Moshe, his intim intimacy, his love for Moshe was so much that the Torah points out in the beginning of the book, Remember what this book is about. God called to, Mo called to Moshe first before he spoke to him. And if you think that just applies to Moshe, Rashi points out in other places in the Torah that there are times that Hashem spoke to Moshe and there are times that he didn't speak to Moshe. And generally that had to do with the behavior of the Jewish people. When the Jewish people were sort of on bad terms with God, God was like radio silent. There was no, there was no prophecy. But when the Jews had done teshuva or were in a high spiritual standing, then the prophecy would come. So that we see that the, the speech of God to the prophet comes through the merit of the Jewish people. So that intimate speech that God had with Moshe was, um, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for, what was sort of preceded by God's affection for Israel. Because he had affection for Israel, therefore he spoke affectionately to his prophet. Moshe. So again, the book of Ayekra begins with the affection to the Jewish people. Now we come to the book of Numbers. Now, based on what I've told you before, this fits perfectly, which of course Rashi points out right away in the beginning of the book of Numbers that because of God's great affection for the Jewish people, He's constantly counting them like we had in the beginning of the book of Exodus. And it's almost like a mirror with Leviticus in the middle. You have the counting of Exodus and you have the counting of 
the book of Numbers, but the book of Numbers contains many more countings and begins with a counting. And so Rashi says in the beginning of the book, because of God's great love for Israel, He counts them again and again in many different ways. Let me count you by the tribes. Let me count you by the camps. Let me count the Levites. Let me count the firstborns. Let me count according to the, from 30 days up. Let me count from 30 years to 50 years. Let me count from 20 years to 60 years. And so on and so forth. We have all these different countings. I'll count you in the beginning. I'll count you in the end. So, affection, affection, affection. Now, we get to Deuteronomy. That's when it becomes a little bit of a puzzle. What is the puzzle in the, that we find in the beginning of Deuteronomy? Is that it begins with, now Deuteronomy in Hebrew is called the book of Devarim because it begins with, these are the words, these are the Devarim, the words that Moshe spoke to the Jewish people. And it's a very strange verse. It says, these are the words that Moshe spoke to the Jewish people. Be'ever hayardin, on the east side of the Jordan, which is where they were. Ba'midbar, in the desert. Now wait a second. They weren't in the desert. They were on the east of the Jordan, which was fertile because the Jordan Valley is fertile. So you're not in the desert. Why does it say in the east side of the Jordan in the desert? That's a contradiction. And it says, Ba'arava. Arava is another region, uh, which was in the, the plains of, of Moab. Mol Suf, across from the Suf, is the, is, the, is the Red Sea, the Reed Sea. Suf is reeds. Across from the Reed Sea. What do you mean across from the Reed Sea? You just told me they were at the bank of the Jordan. Then you told me they were in the desert. Then you told me they were in the plains of Moab. Then you told me they were... Where are they? <laughs> How are they in all these places? Between, between a place called Paran, Paran and a place called, 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 called Tofel. Ve'lavan ve'chateros ve'dizav. Between these places. Paran, Tofel, Lavan, Chateros, and Dizav. So not only are the places contradictory, but Rashi points out they were not in all these places at this time. And some of these names are not even places that we find when we look through the whole book, the whole first four books. And remember, Deuteronomy is more, again, a more or less a repetition of many of the first four books. We don't even find these places mentioned that Israel was ever in such a place. So where, where, why is the Torah mentioning all these strange places and, and what's the meaning of this? So Rashi says rather that what Moshe is doing over here is he's rebuking the Jewish people and each one of these place names is a hint to is a reference to one of the places where the Jews sinned. They sinned in the desert, and they sinned by the Reed Sea, and they sinned in the, in the plains of Moab with the daughters of Moab when they, they were acting promiscuously and followed their gods. And in Paran, they, uh, there was, a, there was a, an abrogation. And what about in Tophel? What about in Tophel? Tophel's not a place. And also Lavan is not a place. And Dizahav is not a place. So what does it mean Tophel and Lavan? So Rashi says, we're just going to peek in the commentary over here, that in Tophel is not the name of a place, but it's a hint to an act. And that is Litapel. Litafel means, Tafel means to diminish something. Is that they diminished something, something they, they shouldn't have, have diminished. diminished. And, and what was the thing they, they diminished? diminished? Lavan, that, that was, was one of the other place things, things which is not a place. place. Tophel is not a place, and Lavan is not a place. Rather, it's a hint to the fact that they diminished the Lavan. Lavan in Hebrew means white. They diminished that which was white. What was white? The man was white, the manna. God poured down manna from heaven, and it was this delicious white food. And the Jewish people, on a number of occasions, complained. He said, ah, we're sick of this. Stuff, stuff that, that you sent us. This was a miraculous food from heaven. I and mean, we're not going to talk about all the miracles that were involved in the manna. But rather than being grateful for it, the Jews were ungrateful, which was a sin. And that's what's being hinted over here. Tofu of love, and they diminished the white. They diminished the manna. They complained against the manna. And it says Chatseros, a place called Chatseros, which means courtyards. Rashi offers different opinions what this might be. It's either a reference to the rebellion of Korach or... It's a, um, a reference to Miriam having spoken Lush and Hara, having spoken uh, slander against Moses, and she was punished for that. And the Jews were supposed to learn from that which Miriam did, and they didn't learn, and they also were guilty of slander. So that's a hint to the sin of Chatseros, which is a reference to Miriam that happened in a place called Chatseros. And then Dizahav, which is another non-existent place. What is it? What, what, why is it mentioned over here? Because di zahav is like the words dai zahav. Dai in Hebrew means enough. And zahav means gold. 
enough gold, that the Jews had too much gold. They came out of Egypt with so much gold and they picked up more gold at the sea when the Egyptians drowned and they brought treasures with them that washed up at the sea and the Jews got even more rich from the treasures of the sea from the Egyptians than they got from taking out of Egypt itself. They had so much gold that they ended up doing what with it? They ended up making an idol out of it. So days of, it was enough gold for you. You had too much gold and you sinned. That's a reference to the sin of the golden calf. So the whole verse is rebuking Israel for their misdeeds. Now, wait a second. How, Rabbi Malit, how is it? You told me that every verse in the beginning of each book of the Torah has to indicate God's love for Israel. And I get it with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. But then we get to Deuteronomy and it's rebuke. And it's telling Israel about their sins. That's harshness. That's not love, is it? So now answer your own question. The answer to your own question, which you're probably answering yourself, is when someone you love is making a mistake, when someone you love is hurting themselves and you care, you're going to say something. If you see something, you say something. A person you don't care about, he's going and harming himself, not my problem, not my problem. But when someone you love, you rebuke them. Now, it has to be, anytime we talk about rebuke, it has to be done carefully and with great, great love and affection. You can't rebuke without love and affection because if you rebuke without love and affection, then you do more damage than good. The person hears harshness from you and they won't accept your words. They get hurt by your words. They feel worse about themselves. The book of Deuteronomy is a rebuke which stands in, con the, again, the opening, which stands in contrast to the other books of the Torah which open up with words of love and affection. How does the rebuke conform with the love and affection that we find at the opening of all the other books? And we were answering by saying that rebuke can only be given through love and rebuke must be given by someone who loves. Not only that the person who needs to hear the rebuke will only hear it from a person that they care for and that they know cares for them. The one who cares for them must help their friend by telling them the thing they need to hear. But in order for those words to be effective, it needs to be done in an affectionate way. Rebuke has to be given with affection. So we're going to see exactly how that is. That just this exact model, that the first four books begin with affection, 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 and then rebuke. That's how rebuke has to be given. You have to always begin with affection. Everyone knows when it comes to relationships. I don't know if everyone knows this. Maybe I'm telling you something you don't know because I had to learn this. And, and not, not too long ago I had to learn this. That... We'll, in relationships, there are deposits and there are withdrawals. We make an emotional deposit when we do something for this person we have a relationship with, a friend, a spouse, a child, whoever it is. When we do something for them that they like, that is, they feel positive about, we're making an emotional deposit. We're, we're charging our, our we're, we're like putting... We're putting uh, money into the bank account of our relationship and we're making it richer and stronger. There's sometimes that we might need to have an interaction with them that's not so pleasant. And when we do, we're drawing a little bit out of the, that account. It sort of, it, it, ha it subtracts a little bit from the affection, but sometimes it's necessary. And the only way we can do that is if we first make a lot of deposits. Each withdrawal actually withdraws much more then each deposit puts in. For, so for any withdrawal that we have to make in a relationship, anytime we need to have sort of an unpleasant interaction, which sometimes are necessary, we have to make sure that before that ever happens, we've made so many deposits that the withdrawal is not going to deplete the account. So here we find that, that model in the Torah. There are many deposits of love, 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 love in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and numbers before there could be a, a withdrawal in the book of, of Devarim, in the book of Deuteronomy. So that itself, that structure shows the relationship of love. But not only that, that the rebuke itself has to be done with love, which is exactly what we find Moses doing or the narrative of the Torah doing. In that sense, I told you that it, it sort of, it seems to be telling a story. These are the words that Moses spoke to Israel in all these various places. And yet, that's not where they were. They were in the east bank of the Jordan, but 
then it says, and it was uh, in the desert. No, they were not in the desert. It was across from the, the, the Red Sea. No, they were not there. It was between Tophel and Lava and Adizahav, which not, are not even real places. Para and Echatzeros, what's, what's with all the names? So again, the Rashi tells us that each one of those places is a hint to an unfortunate event that needed to be needed to be spoken about in order to teach the nation of Israel not to repeat the sin. So, so, so therefore what? Even the rebuke was couched in a gentle language. He didn't come out firing guns blazing and saying, you sin like this over here and you sin like that over there and you sin like that over there and, and, and exposing their sins openly to the world in a way that would be heard very harshly and cause the person to feel terrible and shrink, but rather it's said in a hinting manner. Rashi points out that the sins were only hinted to to preserve the dignity of Israel, that even the rebuke was given in such a way that it preserves the dignity of the one being rebuked. It was said in a hinting way, in a soft language. You remember about that? We need to talk about that. You remember about this? This place, remember, does it ring any bells when I say this word? Like I'm not trying to open old wounds. I'm not trying to put... To, to open a gash in the relationship. I'm just trying to um, triage certain wounds and I'm doing it in the, softest, in the softest way I can with as much anesthetic as possible. We're making this as painless a process as possible. So that model of rebuke is one that is demonstrative of the loving relationship in the Torah. I'm going to say one more, one more insight on this point, and then I'm going to call it a day because I'm running out of time and also I'm running out of memory on my phone. So just to demonstrate this point, there's a verse in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 8 which says, Al tochach leitz pen yisna'eka, don't rebuke a scoffer lest he hate you. Holchach lechacham v'ye'ehaveka, rebuke a wise person and he will love you. The verse doesn't seem to make any sense because the scoffer presumably is the one who needs the rebuke and the wise one is presumably the one who doesn't need the rebuke. And if the scoffer needs the rebuke, why shouldn't I rebuke him? And why should I be concerned whether he'll hate me or not if these are the things that he needs to hear in order to change his ways? And the wise one, what, I need, I need to get people to love me? I need to tell him, I need to tell, I need to, why would he love me if I, if I rebuke him? And why am I rebuking him if he's so wise? So the commentary called the Shela, very famous commentary called the Shela, makes a beautiful insight over here and he says you're misunderstanding the words of King Solomon. This is what he means. He says don't, don't rebuke a scoffer means don't rebuke a person by calling him a scoffer. When you see someone doing something wrong, you don't come in with guns blazing, you don't come in with harshness and say, how dare you, what's wrong with you, you're terrible, you're this, you're that, you start insulting and you, you got to change your ways because you're a terrible person. Why? Because when you attack, a person becomes defensive and you're like, what? You're making me feel so bad, I don't like the feelings you're giving me, I don't like you by extension, you've ruined this relationship if we ever had one. And if we didn't have one, we're certainly not going to have one. And since now I see you treat me with disdain, so now I look to you with disdain. And since I look to you with disdain, I'm not going to take to heart anything you're saying. Just the opposite. Whatever you tell me, I'm going to do the opposite to spite you. So if you're going to rebuke by insulting people, you're going to not only lose, you're going to come out worse than you started. You will achieve the opposite of what you set out to achieve. And that is a sin. That's the wrong way to do it. The Torah says, you do have to rebuke your fellow. But do not, do not put a sin upon him. Now, if I'm rebuking him, I'm not putting a sin upon him. But the idea is that if I rebuke him in the wrong way, I'm going to make him worse. And if he does worse because of my rebuke, then I caused him to sin. That's, that's on me. That's on me. So, altochach leitz. Don't, Rebuke in the manner of calling one a scoffer. Rather, hochach lechacham. Rebuke someone by calling them wise. Come with first the positive emotional deposits. Tell them the good that you see in them. Tell them you have so many good qualities. You're a wise person. You're a kind person. You're, you're, you're a good person in these good things that you do. You're a good person in those good things that you do, in these good things that you say, in those good things that you say. 
Make the positive emotional deposits. Build the relationship and be genuine. Let them see that you really do see the good in them and do see the good in them. Before you look to criticize, look to compliment. What can I find that's good here? Every person has a lot of good in them. Even if the one thing you're focusing on now is negative, there's a lot of good there. Find it first and, and point it out. Show the person that you see that. You see the goodness in them and they'll say, wow, you see the goodness in me. I like that. I like that about you. I like you. Now that I see you respect me, I respect you. And then his ears become open to hear words that you might have to say that are not so positive. You say, such a person like you that's so wonderful and so great. You know how much I care about you. I, I, I feel that in this area some improvement is warranted. Let's talk about it. And then he can hear you. The, rebuke a wise person and he will love you. When you rebuke him in that way by saying you are wise, you are good, positive emotional deposits, then he says, ah, oh, I love this person. We have a positive relationship. Then you can make that once in a while withdrawal. And just a great advice for any relationship, particularly marriages, don't criticize, please. Please, criticism is toxic. Don't criticize your spouse. Please, I'm just begging you one final word if I can have with you. Don't criticize your spouse. When I was a young married person and I didn't know the, uh, the, the, my left from my right and how to be married, of course I pointed out everything negative that my spouse did that I wanted them to change. And boy, did I send that relationship south quickly. And I got some very good advice from a number of wise teachers, which is... Never criticize. Never criticize, but what if they're doing? Never criticize, but also compliment, compliment, compliment. Always find a compliment for your spouse. Always find something they're doing right. Always say good things about them to them and to everyone else. Everyone else you meet, tell them how great your spouse is. Only, never, of course, never to another person <coughs> criticize your spouse. Not to your spouse and not to a person. Never, never, never say something critical about your spouse to someone else. If there's an area that you literally need help, a couple needs help and they need to reach out to a counselor and they need to expose certain negative things, it has to be done wisely. And, and then, of course, in order to help the marriage, sometimes we need to take a step back to take two, two steps forward. But all things being equal, we never criticize our spouse, not to them and certainly not to anyone else. But you can't just not criticize. You have to compliment, compliment, compliment. Find good things. Make them feel good. The, the relationship will improve. All the negative things, they'll disappear because when you compliment, 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 they will love you so much that they will only try to please you because that's the way you're making them feel. That's the relationship you're building. That's the reciprocation that's going to happen. And compliment them to others because it, it, it improves your own honesty and your own... It, genuineness and enthusiasm in feeling positive about your spouse the more you express it so don't just express it to them as like a gimmick and a strategy to get them to like you express it as much as you can to everyone you can about how great your spouse is if you follow this strategy you'll find the positive qualities and you will increase your own recognition of them your own recognition of the greatness of your spouse, your love for your spouse will increase, and those negative things will seem smaller and smaller in your eyes until they're insignificant because the positive qualities of your marriage will so overwhelm them. So that's, you know, great advice in a marriage, but certainly in all our relationships, all our relationships, we can follow this model of compliment, 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 recognize, find the good in the person, point it out, we see from the Torah that we need to be overwhelmingly affectionate with people that we want to have a relationship with. We should have relationships. We should build relationships with as many people as we can, positive relationships. And if, God forbid, there's ever that time that there needs to be that withdrawal, make sure your account is built up very, very strongly. So this, is an, this has been an overview of the five books of Moses and the lessons that we learned from the beginning of each one, we are this week in Parshas Bamidbar, the beginning of the book of Bamidbar, and it's a very re relevant lesson for the Parsha of the week. And of course, for every week, for every year of our lives, thank you for tuning in for this broadcast. I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Take care. That was, pardon me, that was really excellent.
Very, very good. Words to live by. I love the uh, the practical Parsha application uh, that, Rabbi, that you have brought into the show. And I know you're not with us live right now, but you will definitely see the replay. Awesome, wonderful job. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, subscribe, each, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, turn on notifications. And then uh, the goal is to have a weekly Parsha Wednesdays, not Thursday. Uh, Thursday, again, he was out of pocket. Um, he'll be back next Wednesday, Hashem willing. And we'll do Wednesday, uh, same time slot, weekly for the following um, Shabbat for the upcoming Shabbat lesson for you guys so that you can have plenty of good stuff to study and be prepared for before Shabbat shows up. So thank you again all. Uh, Y'all have a great week, and we'll see you in a few hours, actually in about an hour and 20 minutes for the next show. So sit tight, and I will be back. Thank you all for tuning in. See you soon. Shalom. Shoo me, call, shoo me, call, shoo me, call,